Hello, everyone, and welcome to Monday Night Travel with Rick Steves Europe. My name is Gabe Gunning, and I have the privilege of serving as your moderator this evening as we explore not a specific destination, but rather an important issue that affects all nations. Now, without further ado, I would like to turn things over to our host for this evening, Rick Steves. Rick, over to you. Gabe, thank you so much for that great introduction. And I am looking forward to a very stimulating, fascinating, and important hour. Thank you all for tuning in. You know, this is Monday Night Travel. We are travelers. And in our travels, as well as in life, our itinerary can be la la land or it can be reality. And I think it's fun to mix it up a little of both, sure. But tonight, it's all about reality. And I want to I want to share with you a passion of mine, and it's fighting hunger. You know, way back in the 1970s, a stranger I don't know who it was. It was like I, I remember it was like almost on a street corner. He gave me this book, and this is um, Bread for the World, and it teaches the structural basis of poverty. Why in a rich world is there so much hunger, and how can we fight it? I joined the organization that was founded by this, the author of this book, Arthur Simon, Bread for the World. And for 30 years, I've been supporting Bread for the World, and I'm so thankful to have this opportunity to raise my voice in Washington, D.C. through Bread for the World. As a matter of fact, a few years ago, I produced a TV show inspired by my time with Bread for the World called Hunger and Hope, Lessons Learned in Ethiopia and Guatemala. And we're going to be looking at segments from this show tonight over the next hour. And we're also going to be celebrating our successful Christmas fundraiser. Just this last Christmas, we were thrilled that 5,000, more than 5,000 people joined us, and we matched their gift. And I said, if you can raise 500,000, I'll pay 500,000, and together we'll empower the work of Bread for the World with a million dollars. And we've done this now for four or five years in a row, and I'm so proud of that with all of our travelers. So a lot of people tuning in right now had as part of their thank you, a personal invitation to join us now as we get together with the president of Bread for the World and celebrate our work and learn more about it. So the next hour is really the spirit of that Bread for the World book, Why Hunger Exists and How to Best Fight It. I went to Ethiopia and Guatemala on two trips, once to scout and the other to film. And uh, boy, oh boy, what I learned in Ethiopia and Guatemala was such an inspiration. So tonight we'll have film clips from the TV special, about 20 minutes of film clips uh, picked out of that hour special. It's a powerful experience. And then I get the joy of introducing you to the, uh, the president of uh, Bread for the World, Eugene Cho. This first video clip is um, your sort of introduction and it's filled with hope because that's the theme of tonight if we can equip people with the important technology and the education and the support whether they're abadi in ethiopia or diego and katarina who you'll meet in a moment in guatemala you'll see how we can make a difference these people are living examples of how modern aid gives struggling people reason to hope and reason to work hard it's also a good example of how modern aid makes people not dependent but in independent, which I think is very exciting, and we're going to learn why U.S. policy matters. So here's a little three-minute introduction to what I've been talking about, hunger and hope. Hope would be the emphasis here. This program is about how those in extreme poverty, the poorest of the poor, are improving their lives by addressing very basic needs. Progress is incremental, and it happens with a combined and coordinated effort smart non-governmental organizations or NGOs, the support of local governments, development aid and fair trade policies from wealthy countries, and most of all, hardworking local people. In Ethiopia, Abadi and his family are a good example. While still poor, they have a more modern home and are actually making progress. Abadi explained how he's running a productive small farm, growing enough for his family needs with a surplus to sell. He showed me how a tank he fills with manure produces fertilizer. At the same time, it generates methane, or biogas. Abadi can now fire up his stove and boil water without using firewood. He has light even after the sun goes down. 
His home is spacious, with windows for ventilation and a sturdy tin roof. The old kerosene lamp grows dusty, as this light is now powered by a solar panel. And the same panel provides enough juice to charge their cell phones. The family has worked hard and has enough food stored to get them, hopefully, through the hunger season. And a few sheep share the courtyard until they're sold at the market to boost the family income. Here in the highlands of Guatemala, an indigenous Mayan couple, Diego and Caterina, while still poor, are also gaining modest and dignified lives. They told me how, unlike their parents, they were able to buy their land and have diversified their sources of income, growing more crops than just corn and raising goats. An NGO from the United States helped them become landowners, providing a loan and a lawyer to get firm title. When asked how this house was better than their last, Diego showed us their concrete floor, electricity, a bedroom for the children, and running water. And their kitchen has an elevated stove equipped with a chimney. Around the world, great strides in fighting poverty are being made with simple technical upgrades. For example, smarter stoves. Less fortunate neighbors still have an open fire on the floor, wasting firewood and filling their family's lungs with smoke. Elevated stoves with chimneys allow women to stand rather than squat, are more fuel efficient, saving lots of trees, and make living quarters less smoky, avoiding lots of respiratory disease. Families like those we visited have worked hard. They've been provided not with charity, but with a path to development, and they seem to be flourishing. Charity is important for emergencies, but development aid is for the future. Today's development aid is smart. Rather than dependence, it creates independence. It breaks the cycle of poverty, connects people to markets, and opens the door to the benefits of capitalism. Wow. I find that those, those images are just so vivid, so human. And right now, it's my great joy <laughs> and my honor to introduce to you my friend and I'll say my tour guide when it comes to helping me exercise the global citizen I've, citizenship I've gained through my travels right here as a citizen of this great country of ours, how I can raise my voice in Washington, D.C. for my concerns about hunger on this planet. I'd like you to meet Eugene Cho, the president of Bread for the World. Eugene, thanks for being with us. Thank you, Rick, so much. Wow, I am so delighted and honored to be here tonight. Um, not only have I been a huge personal fan of yours for many years now, but it's a privilege to be able to partner together with you and so many of your listeners and travelers to do so much good in our nation and world, especially through the important work of advocacy. Uh, but first, I also wanna add my deep personal gratitude to the near 7,000 travelers and donors who gave so generously and together, this is amazing, we helped raise over $1.6 million, including your match. Nice. Um, I want to introduce Bread for those that might be hearing about it for the first time. Uh, Bread is a Christian advocacy organization that has a long 50-year history of partnering with a diverse audience, including people with no faith or from other religions, all working together with the mission of helping end hunger, both in the United States and around the world, through lobbying and research and organizing and prayer. We urge our U.S. government to put our tax dollars to work in the most effective, efficient ways to end hunger. And every dollar that's donated to Bread for the World correlates to hundreds of dollars that the U.S. government aid for poverty-focused programs. So to help connect the dots, the $1.6 million that we raised from this campaign, it will help secure about $500 million dollars half a billion in federal assistance and all of that to help our fellow global citizens. 
Mm. At Bread, one of our values is something that we call human flourishing, meaning that we believe that every human being has worth and dignity, whether it's a child here in the United States or in Guatemala, in Ethiopia, and they deserve an opportunity to flourish. And this isn't possible without food and nutrition. Again, thanks so much for having me. You're welcome, Eugene. And, and I, it just occurred to me, I, I am looking forward not only to sharing, but from learning from you as we go through these clips. Uh, you know, we decided that Ethiopia and Guatemala would be good classrooms for understanding and hung, hunger, hunger, and they really were. And it's so great to be able to go to these countries and to learn what is structural poverty. And this clip now is the, is the hard to look at clip because I wanted people to see quite graphically extreme poverty because we're coming really we're making good progress in so many ways we're going to visit two communities one off the grid in rural ethiopia and the other one a very poor part of guatemala city these are two vivid examples of a global story illustrating the extreme gap between rich and poor in our world now in the next hour we're going to talk a lot about hope there's exciting work being done but this is our chance right now to look at the hard reality of the 10% of humanity living in what the United Nations calls extreme poverty, people living on about $2 a day. I do want to remind you that in the last generation, there's been huge success in fighting hunger. As a matter of fact, hunger has been cut in half in the last generation. But in the last decade or so, it's ticked up. And Eugene's going to talk about that after we check out this video that gives us a look at the reality of what is extreme poverty. Poverty. Today, of the over 7 billion people on our planet, about half are struggling to live on under $5 a day. And roughly 700 million live in what experts call extreme poverty, trying to make it on under $2 a day. Imagine this cup of coffee cost me a day's wages in the countries where the beans were grown. But there are big changes going on in the developing world where, in my travels, I found hunger and I found hope. Extreme poverty is difficult to witness. Living on less than $2 a day looks about the same around the world. People live on a dirt floor. No electricity, no running water. If they're fortunate enough to own animals, they live together. With an open fire on the floor and no chimney, their homes are dark and filled with smoke. Work is done by hand. They eat one or two plates of a starchy staple a day. Not enough for their children to grow healthy. There's likely little education, job skills, or understanding of good hygiene. The people in this family will probably never be seen by a doctor. One unanticipated crisis, a storm, an accident, a sick parent, and these children go hungry. Hundreds of millions of people like these struggle daily, out of sight and out of mind of those of us who are more privileged. The gap between rich and poor in our world is huge. It's huge between rich countries and poor countries. It's huge within rich countries, including the United States. And it's huge within poor countries. Like any big city, Guatemala City has its poor districts and its wealthy districts. And the gap between rich and poor in Guatemala is particularly wide. The planned community of Ciudad Cayala is a protective haven for people with wealth. With stylish boutiques, name brands, movie theaters, and the kind of relaxed ease that comes with a sense of physical and financial security. The realtor here knows how to sell a condo. You have everything you need? Yeah, you have everything you need. You have the movie theater, you have the supermarket, you have a church, you have restaurants, you have coffees, you have academies, you have, oh, you name it. So you never need to leave this place if you don't want Actually, to. Actually, that's the concept, that you have everything in a walking distance. While the wealthy in such a development have carefully scrubbed cans for garbage, at the other end of the economy, people earn their living digging through garbage. 
In the same city, thousands eke out an existence scavenging from the city dump. Like in many big cities in the developing world, an entire class of people are professional recyclers. Trucks with scavengers hitching a ride rumble in and out of the dump all day. Guatemalans actually compete for the opportunity to work here. Fido Sandoval, a former gang member in the city who spent many years scavenging in this dump, describes the experience. Everyone is working on recycling different kinds of materials. People who are stronger and faster get a little bit of everything. Some have to focus on just one thing. Maybe they are not strong enough, or they get there after the others. So they just get what is left. Every day you're in a struggle, risking your life for basically nothing. It's difficult because you arrive with hope to be able to earn something. And you're in a constant struggle to survive. There is no security. You might earn six dollars today, or you might cut your foot and you have to go to the hospital. What is the stigma of a person who works in the dump? Maybe it's a big stigma, but it's actually scary to learn a new job, to learn something else, because they aren't used to other jobs, because you think you can't do it. The adjacent community, one of the poorest in the city, is built literally on the dump. Buildings are made of salvaged tin. Electricity is tapped illegally from passing wires. In this community, while there's a frail, informal economy, many family incomes are based on bags of trash, scavenged to be recycled. Homes are built with a mishmash of material, as parents work hard to provide the most basic of necessities. Discouraging as this may look, there is reason for hope. Wow. Rick, thank you so much. Wow, that was uh, sobering. And as you shared earlier, it's really important for us to highlight the reality of what's going on. And that juxtaposition of hope and progress, but also some real challenges. You know, you're focusing uh, these videos on Ethiopia and Guatemala. And both of these countries are part of a program called Feed the Future. It's the US government's program to boost agriculture-led growth resilience and nutrition in countries. And here's reason to hope. Because of our advocacy and the US government's leadership, prior to the pandemic, in Ethiopia, poverty had reduced by 19%. And in Guatemala, it was reduced by 29%. Uh, but as we shared earlier in the last decade, there's been an uptick. And in fact, uh, the world right now is experiencing the worst hunger crisis in a generation. So I want to maybe briefly explain why. Uh, in our field, we refer to this as the five Cs. There's five reasons. There's COVID, the effects of COVID, climate change, conflict, rising costs, and then the issue of corruption. The first three are the main contributors to the uptick of hunger around the world. So just think about this for a second. We're gonna be speaking about hope, but we do have to talk about the sobering reality right now. In the United States, there's 17 million children in the wealthiest nation in the world that experienced food insecurity last year. Uh, in the world, an estimated 45 million children under the age of five uh, experience something called uh, childhood wasting, which is the most dangerous form of malnutrition. So this isn't the time to let up, to be apathetic or to be cynical. We've got to stay hopeful, be engaged, be generous, raise our voices. Mm -hmm. uh, we can make a difference. And Eugene, I like to focus on what I call the low-hanging fruit of development aid. It just gives me 
great hope. I'm always looking for a budget, you know, and that's kind of my middle name when it comes to travel and my work. And the really a good example of a low hanging fruit would be something called stunting. Uh, and we're going to learn about that in just a minute here, but it deals with uh, getting a child the right nutrition in that first thousand days so they can grow up and be functioning fully. Uh, you know, there's a lot of cynicism among people who know about old fashioned aid, but I got to say modern aid is not your grandmother's aid. Now we are smart. We are pragmatic. It's not cultural imperialism. And this next clip will show a bit about the practicality of investing people. And, uh, you know, anybody who's a person of faith is really into that idea of love your neighbor. For me, this is a great way to love your neighbor. It's a way for my love to get traction. And it's also a way to build peace and stability, both here in the United States and abroad. So right now, let's take just a couple of minutes and we will learn about this single issue, one of many of these low hanging fruits where we can tackle one issue and make a big difference. This is mm. stunting. Laura Mello, who runs the UN's World Food Program in Guatemala, dedicates her work to nutrition education in vulnerable communities. Guatemala has a very serious problem when it comes to poverty and uh, chronic malnutrition, what we normally call stunting. Stunting is a global problem. It's a problem that affects many countries. Unfortunately, Guatemala is one of the top four countries in terms of prevalence of stunting. It's a very serious but invisible problem. It basically consists of children who do not have the quality of food that they should during the first thousand days of their existence. And that compromises their development throughout their entire life, both physically as well as cognitively. So it's not as if children don't get enough to eat, they do but it's not good enough food, it's not smart calories. A lot of people think that people in Guatemala are short and that it's genetics. That's not true. They are short because they are stunted. They are short because they didn't have the quality, the smart nutrients that allow them to develop. If we have a country like Guatemala, where almost half of the children are stunted, that means that about half of the children of this country cannot fulfill their potential. So I think it's a more than necessary investment to make sure that this problem disappears, that these children fulfill their potential. In both countries, thanks in part to U.S. funding, I saw mothers learning important skills such as to breastfeed for at least six months, how to cook with nutritional supplements to be sure children receive not just calories, but healthy calories, and to teach children to wash their hands with soap so they stay healthier. If we don't wash our hands, if we don't have basic hygiene, then even if a child is eating good food, then they get very easily sick. And by getting sick, then they have diarrhea, then they lose the, the, the good nutrients that are getting. A healthy child is more likely to become a productive adult. Rather than a life sentence of poverty, well-nourished young people will be capable of learning and therefore helping to lift their families and community out of poverty. Wow. I, Eugene, it's such this a blessing a... to have seen this, to be able to see this, because you cannot unsee it. It's so human, it's so inspiring and it makes you want to make a difference uh it's amazing that's very informative and uh laura mello of the wfp i think she said it so succinctly uh there's no need for me to repeat uh everything that she said but i want to just highlight one of the phrases that she mentioned because this is an example of a uh, smart development and she referred to as the first thousand days from a child's conception to a child's second birthday. Uh, it's one thing if people didn't know what to do, but science and research has proven that that window is so critical to a child's neural development and health into adulthood. So we know what works, but we're lacking the political will to make a difference. Uh, in this work, and it was referred to a couple of times, 
We call it the power for interventions. These four things make a dramatic difference. Uh, one is prenatal vitamins for pregnant women. The second one is breastfeeding support for mothers. The third one is vitamin A supplementation. And then the last one is something called RUTF, which means ready to use therapeutic food. These four um, uh, sources make a tremendous impact in the fight against stunting and wasting. This is an example of smart development. Thank you. Now this next video clip is gonna focus on health. And it occurred to me while I was traveling in Ethiopia and Guatemala that when people are healthy, they're better able to climb out of poverty. It's kind of a prerequisite. And health posts are, are in off the grid communities that have no access to, to health care. And they're opened one day a week when, when the United Nations World Food Program van comes in. And this kind of van is made possible by USAID. Uh, it's a good example of how the United Nations through the World Food Program really understands what is needed. The highlight of my Ethiopia visit in a lot of ways was getting off the grid way, way deep into the country and seeing one of these health posts in action, how it empowers local women and then coming away with this understanding that a healthy population is a foundation of stability. Here's one example of getting, I think, huge bang for your development aid buck. An effective way to fight hunger is to focus on health and nutrition. After all, if you're sick, you're more likely to be poor. And if you're healthy, you're better able to climb out of poverty. In many developing countries, the government, often with the help of the United Nations World Food Program, maintains health posts like this one in Ethiopia. Extremely poor people have no money for health care, but this health post provides the basics in the village for free. Pauline Akabwe, a local UN worker, explained how they educate young mothers who gather here twice a month to help them raise healthier babies. A health post is the smallest unit of health in Ethiopia and this is one of the health posts. The reason why we have a health post is because of the close proximity to the community and the mothers and our beneficiaries do not need to pay any money to receive services. The main objective is to prevent malnutrition. We have a program uh, called Targeted Supplementary Feeding Program mm -hmm. and the program targets children under five years with moderate acute malnutrition and also pregnant and lactating women with moderate acute malnutrition. One of the activities that we do is to screen for malnutrition, moderate acute malnutrition. They measure the arms of the children, and if, it, uh, if the pointer shows yellow, it means the child is moderately acute malnourished. We also weigh children. During, when you're screening for malnutrition, you weigh children. Along with being malnourished, children in the developing world are more likely to contract a host of dangerous diseases. Inoculations are an example of a global success of a United Nations-led initiative. Measles, typhoid, and pneumonia, until recently commonplace in the poor world, are easily avoided with cheap and simple vaccinations. Thanks to a UN program, nearly all the world's children are now inoculated against these most deadly diseases, and child mortality has dropped dramatically. Wow. What do you make of that, Eugene? Well, you know, as you already know, Bread's mission is to help end hunger, but we also know that hunger intersects with so many other important aspects like health and education. And so it's really important that you highlight the critical nature of health posts. Um, I'll just give an example. For a small fraction of our US budget, not even half a percent of 1%, one of the U.S.'s flagship food aid programs is something called the McGovern Dole Food Program for Education and Child Nutrition Program. And it's because we want to invest in the health of children. Uh, just in the year 2021, the McGovern Dole Program, this is stunning, it helps support feeding about 2.1 daily meals, about two meals a day to 4 million children, women, and families, helped train approximately 11,000 teachers as well. There's another program called Food for Peace. And that program, again, by the power of uh, 
the U.S. Uh, taxpayer money because we want to make sure that this document or the uh, our, our budget is a moral document. It helped reach over 71 million people in 57 mm. countries with food assistance. And you got a chance to see with your own eyes some of the power and impact of those investments. I just am so inspired by the effectiveness of this work. And uh, I, I wish... I just wish more people had a chance to actually witness that as we did, to, to realize what's going on these days. Now, another of these low-hanging fruits is, is the importance of an educated uh, populace, an educated workforce. You know, an educated workforce is sort of a prerequisite today to be part of the globalized economy, and that really is the ticket for development. Uh, in this next clip, be sure to look at the students, because uh, when you look at these students, they could be our own children, and especially the girls. Girls have long been disadvantaged when it comes to getting education because families only have enough money for the books and the uniforms for one child and the boy has traditionally gotten that. Now that is changing. By the way, I learned, I always learn so much on these kind of adventures when we're filming that I can't put it into the little script. So I like to write a book that is a partner with the TV show. And this is the book that I wrote, uh, including all the information I wish I could have put in the TV show. And uh, you'll get that uh, email tomorrow that has links to lots of things where you can get more information about Bread for the World. You can get a link to watch the entire one hour show you're seeing clips of now, and you'll get a free PDF link. And that gives you this whole book with beautiful pictures and more importantly, all the information that will build upon what you're seeing right now. So let's go now to a clip that really focuses on the beauty of educating a society that is wanting so dearly to develop and pull itself out of extreme poverty. Education is critical. Governments, private enterprise, and parents are realizing that an educated workforce is a prerequisite for development in today's global economy. In terms of pure economy, workers are considered human capital, and they produce more when healthy and educated. Like many developing nations, Ethiopia aspires for all children to have about eight years of schooling. In both countries, we saw committed teachers and eager students. Development workers have learned the value of education for girls. Girls with an education gain more control of their lives. Educated women have fewer children, and when they do start a family, their children are generally healthier. Even with meager resources, it seems that as long as students are healthy and adequately nourished, they're eager to learn. They know that a better future depends on being able to read and write. For these students, a few months of vocational training prepares them to get a job. Computer labs, welding skills, plumbing, and a field with lots of future employment being a solar panel technician. Ah, the beauty of education. Uh, Rick, I've already shared a bit about various programs and legislation. So for the time being, I just wanna highlight why I think fighting hunger is so important to so many things, including education. Uh, just to all the viewers that are here, just imagine for a second, trying to do something if you're hungry. Uh, we make jokes about it. Uh, the terminology that we use in our home is hangry. Like it affects our emotions, we get upset. But imagine trying to learn when you're a child, mm. uh, not just when you're hungry, but when you're famished or mal malnourished. Mm. Uh, this is why we believe food and nutrition are the great gateway to flourishing, including for education. Yes, indeed. And uh, these are th important things to think about. And I think about them even more these days, Eugene, because, um, well, I just became a grandfather. And this is, <laughs> this is my beautiful little 14 month old grandchild named <laughs> Atlas. I love this name, Atlas. And when I think of my darling grandchild, Atlas, I also think of the joy my daughter Jackie has in, in being able to raise this child with uh, all of the love that she can give him. And that takes uh, uh, all the things that we're hoping for in the uh, global south and the developing world. 
And when I think of the joy that I get from my time with Atlas, a lot of people might think, well, Rick, now you're going to really get more realistic and your cares will be coming closer to home. But, you know, as a person of faith, it's clear to me, if you believe in a God, we're all children of God. And that makes us all brothers and sisters. And, uh, you know, suffering and need across the street is no more real than suffering and need across the sea. And we see this. And when we travel, we get to know the family. And when we have mm -hmm. a grandchild, we're reminded of how rich and powerful this love is. And you see people mm -hmm. on the other side of the world with a grandchild. And you're reminded that their love is just as beautiful, just as precious, just as valuable as our love. And Eugene, I often think about somebody who's chosen to work in this field like you. What a what a what a dedication, what a what an overwhelming um, challenge, as well as an opportunity. Can you tell us a little bit about your life story and, and how you were I, you're a neighbor of mine here in Seattle, and you were well known locally for being a wonderful pastor with a thriving church, yet you ended up working in Washington, D.C. with a hunger advocacy organization. Tell us how and why. Uh, yeah. Rick, first of all, congratulations on being a granddad. Those pictures are amazing. And I feel like those pictures steal the show here because it's so adorable. Uh, but I want to maybe speak about my father, uh, because I think the reason why I do so much of what I do or the story of my parents. Uh, my father was born in what is now called North Korea. He was born in a small little village outside of a larger city called Pyongyang, which is the capital city today of North Korea. He grew up in just tremendous poverty and hunger. Some of the stories that he shares are so painful to hear, including being so hungry as a, as a young boy, pulling out grass from the ground and consuming it just to satisfy his hunger pangs. Mm. But there was kindness and there was generosity that was given and shown to him. And I feel so compelled to make sure that I pass it forward to others, that the story that he shares from many, many years ago uh, are not stories that we have to share from today. And the reality is that these are still short stories that are happening right now. Now I wanna kind of maybe zoom in on my immediate family. Uh, this is my wife, Minhee. We've been married now for 27 years. We have three mostly grown children. And they're out and about in the workforce pursuing their dreams. And as a parent, there is nothing that gives me more joy and giddiness than to be able to discuss and help my kids pursue their hopes and dreams. And the reason why I say that is I've had the chance of traveling to over 40 nations to learn about development and hunger and poverty. I've had a chance to meet with local leaders and experts and farmers and I've also had a chance to meet with many other parents around the world. One of the parents I wanna introduce our viewers to tonight is this woman named Sahara. Sahara is from the rural area in Kenya. She has seven children. There's three children being shown here. And I remember this conversation when I asked Sahara, uh, when you wake up in the morning, what's the first thing that come to your mind? And for her, it wasn't so much about hopes and dreams, even though as parents, that's a common bond for her. It was this question, where will I get food and water to feed my kids today? Mm -hmm. uh, that is such, I think, a important reminder to us, that, as you said earlier, that everyone matters. So at Bread for the World, what a privilege and an honor to serve as its president. And it allows me as a representative of bread to be at tables where discussions and decisions are being had, important decisions. Here we have Secretary Vilsack, who is part of the White House administration. He's the Secretary of Agriculture, oversees a tremendously important current program called the Farm Bill, which has tremendous influence on both domestic and international hunger. I have another picture here, and this is with Senator Bozeman, and he's a ranking member in the Senate. And the reason why I'm showing a picture of Senator Bozeman here mm. is because we have pictures or photos of other bread members around me. And bread has 
members in every single congressional district in the United States, approximately 200,000 people. And I hope that there might be viewers today who feel inspired to join. And one of my, if I'm a little biased here, one of my favorite members happens to live in the Seattle Edmonds area. Uh, and Rick, maybe you could share a little bit about this photo. Ah, uh, well, <laughs> I'll tell you, it's so much fun to be your neighbor. Uh, my girlfriend, Shelly, and I enjoy getting together with you and Min Hee and to gain an education in Korean food for sure. And just to be able to network with you and share our enthusiasm for life and for just getting getting busy and e exercising our, our passion for making this world a more just and fair place. Well, one of my joys is to help you become a convert of Korean food, and I think I've succeeded. Oh, there's another thing you've succeeded in. Well, well aside from the awkward grunting here, uh, we have enjoyed some great um, community time together by playing ping pong. And I am, um, I'm embarrassed to say that I've taught you how to play and now you have surpassed my skills and that's not <laughs> cool. Oh, but what is cool was deep. Ooh. Deep in the darkest times of COVID, we uh, we got together when it was kind of scary to get together, but I wanted to personally give you this check for half a million dollars from our company, uh, which was matching uh, 5,000 of our travelers that gave $100 each. And that was one of these annual $1 million uh, boosts that we're able to give as travelers to Bread for the World because through our travels, we've seen that the world can be a better and more stable and more just place if the United States can be an actor in that. And uh, that was just a happy day, wasn't it, Eugene? Man, thank you again so much. I mean, for the last five years, but particularly during the most difficult, challenging year of the COVID years, mm -hmm. when I think so many of us operated out of a mentality of scarcity and the fact that you were so faithful and committed it meant so much to all of our team and staff. Well, it was my joy to be able to do this. And it's also my joy, uh, Eugene, to introduce to our travelers the concept of advocacy. A lot of people, they want to give, they want to help, and they don't know the best way to help. And there's a reason for every kind of charity and every kind of development aid. But I, I'm really looking for the maximum way to leverage my philanthropic giving. And I find that it is through advocacy. Can you define advocacy for us? Sure. Well, like you, we want to celebrate food banks and direct relief services. Uh, we want to encourage that. But the reason why we believe in advocacy is we're not going to food bank our way out of hunger. And so in the most simple definition of advocacy, Advocacy is the act of generating public support or recommendation of a particular cause or policy. It means that we're going to speak up and urge our elected leaders and by the power of a signature, that one signature has the capacity to impact not just one, but to impact thousands or hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. Uh, the founder of Bread for the World, and you reference him and that book, Art Simon, he has this quote where he said, quote, it's better to build a fence at the top of a cliff than to have an ambulance at the bottom. And so we want to be able to get to some of the root causes of hunger, both here in the U.S. and around the world. And we want to make sure that in a nation where it feels like sometimes those who are powerful or wealthy have access to be heard, we wanna make sure that our neighbors, both here in the US and around the world, everybody has a voice, but the injustice is not everyone is heard. And we wanna make sure through the mission of advocacy that everyone's voice is heard. You know, Eugene, there's so many issues we could talk about. And if we had more time, I'd love to know what is the current agenda of Bread for the World. But I'd like for you just in a nutshell to explain one of these uh, to us. And uh, something I, I keep hearing a lot about is the child tax credit. And this is important because it's domestic. We're looking at Ethiopian Guatemala, and there's a lot Bread does for that through our government. But tell us for, for, for an example of something that Bread is getting done. How are you involved in the child tax credit and why would that matter? 
It's a great question. Uh, and this impacts probably people that are watching this show right now and people that we know. The child tax credit is a federal tax benefit that plays an important role in providing financial relief or support for taxpayers with children. Uh, for example, we know through research that approximately 16 million children would benefit from this child tax credit expansion. It hasn't been expanded, but it's being discussed and debated right now. Uh, and 500,000 children in our own backyards in this country would be lifted out of poverty. And the reason why we have this data is during one year, during uh, the pandemic COVID years, just a couple of years ago, we saw the child tax credit implemented and we saw childhood hunger dramatically impacted. That's one example. You know, I'm, it's just, I'm lucky because I've seen for 30 years, I've been with Bread for the World. I've been in the halls of Congress with Bread for the World, um, talking with senators, talking with Congress people, learning about lobbying from you guys. And I got to say, lobbying has a bad uh, image because there's a lot of people who lobby for things we don't agree with. I see Bread for the World as a team of very um, uh, uh, smart and, and, and knowledgeable lobbyists that work to have a place at the table when decisions are made that deal with hunger domestically and internationally. We, you put together a couple of uh, clips from senators and we're gonna run a clip uh, right next, right now from a Republican senator from Indiana and a Democrat senator from Ohio. Can you set this up before I roll these videos? Sure. Uh, well, one of the things that we've learned in 50 years of doing this work is that we have to work in bipartisan ways. So Bread is a nonpartisan organization working in bipartisan ways. And here's why it matters so much, because it's practical, meaning that if there's any changes in administrations, when you have bipartisan support for certain bills or legislation, it's not going to be attacked or dissolved but it will continue to have lasting effect. First video, Senator Todd Young, a Republican from Indiana. Second video, Senator Sherrod Brown, a Democrat from Ohio. It's really important for us to build relationships with leaders from both sides. Hello, I'm Senator Todd Young. Over the years, I've received countless letters from members of Bread for the World. Many of these letters are personalized and ask me to support specific policy solutions to the problems of domestic and international hunger and food insecurity. I've been moved by these letters and I've learned from reading them. Messages like these are important in helping elected officials discern their own stances on critical public policy issues. So I'd encourage you to keep your letters, your phone calls, and your visits coming. You're making a difference, and I appreciate you taking the time to communicate with me and my team. Thanks so much, and God bless. I'm Sherrod Brown. It's an honor to represent Ohio in the United States Senate. Bread for the World, as some of you know, is an organization nearer to my heart. Uh, my values mostly came from my mother. My mom grew up in a small town in Georgia. She was offended by uh, the racism in Georgia, the Southern brand of racism. When she married my dad after meeting him at a soldier's dance when he came back from World War II, meeting him in Washington and moved to Mansfield, Ohio. Uh, she was bothered by the racism, the Northern brand of racism. And she took, she was involved in the YWCA whose mission is to eradicate racism and empower women. And she was, uh, she dove headlong into two other organizations, Habitat for Humanity, and especially Bread for the World. Through our little Lutheran church in Mansfield, St. Luke's Lutheran, she was the activist for the whole community, really, for Bread for the World. She encouraged, she encouraged all of us to write letters in the collection plate, got others to do it. Really, her activism really did, uh, did make a huge difference. So I thank you all for that activism. These letters that you write, they make a real difference. In his letter from the Birmingham jail, Dr. King wrote, human progress never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts and persistent work of men and women willing to be co-workers with God. It's up to all of us as citizens, as leaders, as members of our churches, as activists in our communities to push, to push our country forward. Thanks for the, thank you for your work. Thank you for your activism. 
Well, I always feel like legislators are good, generally good people that need help understanding different issues. And a lot of people, they find themselves in a position of huge power and they don't know much about that issue and they're eager to learn. And when they learn from one of their constituents, whoever gets to sit at the table with them, it can impact their vote. Well, one of the things that uh, Senator Young shared is that he learns from these letters. Uh, leaders are humans. They can't possibly know everything about everything. And so this is an opportunity for Bread for the World to educate our members so that mm -hmm. they feel equipped to speak with their members of uh, Congress. Eugene, what is Bread for the World's biggest need right now? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I would say it's people's voice. Uh, because we're an advocacy organization, we're trying to form this powerful uh, choir of members from around the country, from all different backgrounds, who care uh, about human flourishing, who care that our neighbors near and far. So I would encourage people, join Bread for the World. We need your voice. Sign up. Don't become cynical in a polarizing world. I get it. It can be exhausting, but we've got to stay engaged. Uh, sign up, build a relationship with Bread for the World. How, how do you deal with the division in our government right now and the dysfunction? Uh, is hunger a, a partisan issue or can you frame it in a way where people on either side of the aisle can embrace it? You know, I don't want to give you a fake answer. It's hard. It's challenging. Uh, I'm watching the same news that you're watching and that our viewers are watching. It is a very polarizing time. But if there is some reason to be very hopeful, no one is calling their member of Congress and saying, I want children or more children in the United States or around the world to go hungry and suffering. That's not happening at all. It's not a partisan issue. Now, our disagreements might be on solutions and methodology, and that's where we need uh, uh, constituents to reach out to their leaders to say, let's have discussions and debates so that more human beings can experience flourishing rather than destruction or hunger. And one theme I, I kept, um, I was very mindful of, is that there's a lot of people that just will only see the world through the lens of capitalism. And I, I can buy that. It's a capitalistic system that we live in, whether we like it or not. And globalization is here. It's a globalized economy. And what I one of my takeaways from being in Ethiopian Guatemala was poor farmers across the world, they want to be businessmen, they want to produce, they want to sell, they don't mm -hmm. want to leave the culture that that they are part of. They want to flourish, they want to be in the game. And yep. I've got a video clip right now that shows a couple of very proud farmers, uh, Pedro and Anna, and mm -hmm. I talked to them. And I t and they told me they just want to be able to work hard and be part of the global economy. And this is an example right here of how they are now a part of the global economy. They're growing crops that they don't even eat because they know people in England want to eat them and they're making a profit and they're mm. part of that system. Let's go to Guatemala and see some of the fruits of smart de developmental aid in our age. While big agriculture, like sugar and coffee, is well-connected with the global economy, a formidable challenge in the fight against poverty is for landless family farmers to also get into the game. High in the hills of Guatemala, an NGO has helped Pedro and Anna buy land and counsels them to maximize their yield and profit. Pedro used to leave his family for work in the coffee plantations. He still works hard, but now he's independent. The loan's paid off, and he owns the land. Through the NGO worker, Pedro shares his story. The NGO uh, helps them to find the land and to have the lawyers for all the local papers so they own the piece of land. So no sugar plantation can come here. He's got this land for his he's, family. He's, he has his land for his family, yes. And his son will have the land when he is finished. 
they will stay here instead of going to other places. Mm -hmm. So they will be with the family all year round. So the, the, the landless farmer is a migrant farmer. He, he leaves, leaves his family farmer. to cut sugar cane or work in the oh, coffee, coffee plantations. Yeah. Anna and Pedro's main crop, at least right now, it's not corn or beans like you might guess, but snow peas. Pedro, ustedes comen este estas alberjas aquí en el área, en la casa? No, no. Entonces, ¿por qué la siembra? Okay. No, they don't eat it here, but they grow it for selling. That's the main business. It's not what the locals eat, but what international demand and prices make most profitable. And right now, that's peas. Throughout the valley, farmers like Pedro are bringing their bags of peas to the weigh station to sell to a middleman or exporter. These peas are export quality, carefully picked, and put into crates with all the children helping. I love this shot. Just look at this cute little girl working so hard in her family farm and such joy because mm. she knows they've got the dignity of hard work and progress. And within a short time, they're off to the market. Much of this shipment will end up sold in England. It's mm. a long way from Pedro's Pea Patch to the supermarket in London. You know, that makes me so happy. And I'll never forget, I was there filming and uh, I couldn't stop eating those peas. And my producer <laughs> said, Rick, stop eating the peas. You got to do the interview with the guys. And uh, it was just so joyful to meet these people and uh, to see what, 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 our, what, what we can do to help. I also want to remind our viewers tonight that um, I'm just remembering what a rich experience it was to go there, to scout this, to learn about this. Uh, first time around, I traveled with... Uh, with uh, the man who was president of Bread for the World for 25 years, I believe before you, David Beckman. Uh, he was my sidekick as I did all that scouting, and that was a blessing. And then the next time I went back with my wonderful crew that's been making TV with me for 30 years, if you wanna see the whole hour, it's free, you can watch it anytime, gather your friends or whatever, you can see it at the PBS app, uh, uh, and just look for the, the Rick Steves special on hunger and hope, or you can go to ricksteves.com and watch this. It's just a click away, and it would give you a lot more information than these disjointed little clips. You know, Eugene, that last clip reminded me that there, and this is something we don't quite understand, half of the world is smallholder farmers, 50% of humanity, just toiling away in the farm. It's dignity, it works if, if everything is fair, yeah they can have a life of hope and raise their kids healthy and so on. Uh, but it's, it's a complicated world and trade policies in Washington, D.C. have a huge impact south of the border on hardworking, um, struggling farmers. Uh, many times I saw examples of that and, and David Beckman would just say, this is what we were working on three years ago. Look at it here. Uh, mm. Can you, can you uh, build on that idea just a bit as we wrap things up here? Sure. I mean, it, it is very complicated. I'll, I'll just give you one example and story since we're talking about both Guatemala and Ethiopia. There's a legislation, a trade policy called AGOA, and it's the most important legislation that defines trade relationships between the United States and the sub-Saharan Africa. And it's one of those trade policies where you want both entities to benefit. And as we're talking about both entities, and you mentioned smallholder farmers, in Africa, there's research where 70% of the smallholder farmers in that continent happen to be women. And so there's got to be provision and investments to make sure that we're investing in these smallholder farmers, not just for dignity, but when you invest in women, research has shown it transforms their families and their communities as well. The world thrives and we need more of that. Mm. There is... It is so clear, it is so clear that women are the best investment in the developing world. And that's an example of modern development aid, this new uh, realization that we need to not just throw money at a society, but to artfully get it where it's going to really make a difference and get some traction. Uh, Eugene, this has been fun. I think we've got a chance now to answer some questions. Uh, Gabe, uh, do you have some questions from all of our viewers? We have a lot of excellent questions, and I just want to say what a pleasure it's been to be behind the scenes in the Q&A tonight, to see all of people's 
really thoughtful comments and questions. Um, we have time for just a few right now. Um, first, Paul was kind of pointing out today in the news, you know, we see so much about um, Eugene, you had mentioned one of the seas being conflict, and we see conflicts in places like um, Gaza and in Ukraine. Um, is that something that you think about with Bread for the World, or is, does that kind of get back to the dichotomy between charity for emergencies and development for more kind of normal daily life in certain places? No, it's a great question, and I'm glad that you highlighted that because it's something that we think about every single day. I mean, how can you not? Our mission is to help end hunger, and while uh, we invest in development, there are times we need immediate humanitarian assistance. One of the priorities, one of the things that we are working on right now is something that we call the emergency supplemental. And so we have been reaching out to our members, asking them, to reach out to their members of Congress uh, to support this emergency supplemental humanitarian assistance. It's a package that's about $10 billion that would go towards supporting assistance in Ukraine, in the Middle East, including Gaza, but also some of the other hunger hotspots around the world that sadly have not made it to mainstream media, such as Sudan and Somalia, Armenia, and even in Ethiopia again. So yes, we're absolutely focused and working on it and would love to encourage people to check us out at bread.org to learn more about how they could reach their members of Congress. And kind of building off of that, I think with the, the news of those conflicts, we are hearing about kind of general aid packages being caught in gridlock in Congress. You talked a little bit about um, working in a bipartisan fashion to try to avoid that. Has that, do you typically see quite a bit of success in that? Are there any of your initiatives that are currently caught, caught in that gridlock? Or um, would you say that you have a better success rate than other types of um, measures that people are trying to get past? It's a challenging time. Uh, I, I don't want to mince words. This is the reason why advocacy matters. You know, I wish I could be on the show with Rick and all we would be doing is talking about travel and where I'd like to go uh, in my free time. But the reality is because this is such hard, critical work and there are real barriers, this is why we've got to reach out to our members of Congress, be respectful, and help humanize hunger around the world, and not just look at it merely from a political lens, but to also remind people of the human lens that's happening right now. And just for me personally, if I can just be honest here, as someone that has traveled to Palestine, uh, to the Middle East, to Israel numerous times, I think of faces and people that I have spent time with and met with and broken bread with. And as a result, for me, my advocacy isn't so much about taking sides, but making sure, especially children, are not caught uh, in the consequences of conflict. And sadly, that's what's happening. So yes, there are some real challenges, which is the reason why we wanna encourage people, let's form that choir uh, and you know, as a person of faith, you know, I'm praying for the release of hostages, for a ceasefire, and for lasting peace in that region. And uh, a question that I think both of you can speak to, Rick, especially given your travels, some of which we've seen tonight. Um, Susan is wondering, once we get past those challenges and over those barriers, um, and we get these programs and aid to people, do you typically find that the communities are really receptive, that there's a lot of community support for these programs? Because um, I know sometimes there can be aversion to change in all parts of the world. I'll let G Eugene start with that. Well, I mean, it, it's a great question. No, no one is going to say that development is perfect. And anytime you hear someone say that it's perfect, you should run away. That's not an organization that you probably want to partner with. Uh, it is messy because it involves people, and that involves me in my own life here in Seattle. But yes, generally speaking, we know this because over the last 50 years, we've seen evidence of tremendous innovation and change. 
And one of the innovations that I am seeing right now from my perspective is a terminology called localization. And it's really about how do we elevate local leaders, indigenous mm -hmm. leaders? How do we make sure that we're not uh, trying to produce a, uh, a hand-me-down, but a kind of a hands-up so that people are equipped and empowered to lift themselves and their communities out of poverty? It's interesting, Eugene, because I just jotted down my answer and it, each one of my points has the word local in it. It's mm. hard to tell a farmer, this is smart, you'll grow more corn. But what you can do is find one farmer that's innovative and a risk taker, and he can do it. And then they all talk. And if one of their neighbors is succeeding with something that was scary and West, you know, from a foreign country or whatever, they'll just see his kids now have better nutrition and, and, and are doing better. And then that good idea will spread, but it can't be forced on a community. Another thing is local ownership. If you don't give, if, if, if a community doesn't have to own and maintain its water system by all paying in a little bit, just a dollar a month for each family that has access to the well, then that's going to be neglected. But if it's locally owned, it's much more likely to be functioned and taken care for. Uh, people know that women are the way to invest in communities these days all across the developing world. Men just piss it away and you know spend it on gambling or alcohol or women. I, I'm just embarrassed about my gender when it comes to what is needed for these communities to, to develop and to have uh, healthy, strong families and so on. And the last thing is support existing local organizations. I love uh, Lutheran World Relief, uh, which I also support because that's their whole thing, is not coming in with a first world organization, but finding a pre-existing organization that understands the tempo and the, and the taboos and the rationales and the traditions and, the, and, the, and the, the, the fine points of a society. And that organization can be empowered and then they can do the good work. Hey, we are, and Eugene, uh, um, one more thing. I want to just add one thing. This is really important. I want to introduce people to a word called mutuality. And that means that we here in the West, there's so much for us to learn from local leaders in other countries. Their resilience, their innovation, it is profound. And so that mutuality, we have so much yeah. to learn. I, I love that. And that would be a whole... I've, I, I just love that whole concept. We'll do that another time. Right now, I want to remind our, our, our viewers, our travelers, that there are a lot of ways to fight hunger. And if you're wondering the best way, you know, if you join Bread for the World, just tune in. It's at bread.org. You can stay up to date. You can learn. As an individual, you can lobby your, lob, lobby your congressperson. There are so many stories in, in the whole Bread for the World uh, team of individuals in their community that made a huge difference just by dropping in on their congressperson, or you can empower Bread to do the same thing. We've been talking about advocacy. Advocacy is, in my estimate, how my love gets traction. And you can uh, uh, agree to make a monthly donation, big or small. It doesn't really matter as much as it matters to just get on board. We have a very strict policy at Rick Steves Europe whenever we support an organization like Bread for the World not to give our advertising list or our uh, electronic uh, address list to that organization. But we give that you an opportunity to take the initiative to get on board after we've shared our passion for something. So tomorrow, everybody who's tuned in who signed up for this talk today, they're going to get an email. And on that are going to be links to bread.org, uh, links to how you can get going with bread, how you can join the team. And uh, if you want to, if you're inspired to, to get on board, that would be great. If you're inspired in your own way, just to be more aware of the reality of hunger and how we can solve this. As I always like to say, it's not just, it's not just love your neighbor. It's a, it's a twofer. It's love your neighbor. And if you don't care about that, it's an investment in stability. It's an investment in peace. And these are beautiful causes. The last clip I want to run, and then we're going to call it a, um, a, a, a trip, is uh, uh, the last clip of the whole show. And this really is about how uh, it sums up the issues we've been talking about, and it talks about the importance of helping to mobilize our government to fight hunger through advocacy. So check this out, and then we will be on our way. Here we go. The impact of big issues like these, globalization, conflict, climate change, it seems beyond any one individual's control. 
But when we act collectively, we do make a difference. Walking with people like Anna, Abedi, Lisa, Diego, Marta, the hardworking people who make the developing world develop, shows the human value of tackling hunger. And the uptick in extreme poverty in recent years has made fighting it more urgent than ever. Traveling through Ethiopia and Guatemala, witnessing both the lives of people in extreme poverty and the economic realities of our world, makes me consider my relationship to it all. Why should I care? What should I do? How can I, as an individual, make a difference? Like many people, I want to do something to reduce the obscene gap between rich and poor. But we can also go beyond our own modest individual efforts and support a much broader solution. That's exciting, and it's an opportunity. America spends $700 billion a year on our military to make us safer. That's hard power, and hard power is necessary. But it needs to be complemented by soft power. Soft power is investing in development, diplomacy, stability, and that also makes us safer. Soft power is real power. It's good for our national security. For example, for the annual cost of one extra soldier deployed overseas, we could dig a hundred wells in thirsty villages. It's a societal choice we make. The accepted goal among wealthy nations is to invest around 1% of their GDP for development aid, and lots do. While many Americans think we're giving far more than that, in reality, the United States gives less than a quarter that amount. For every $100 of our GDP, we give less than 25 cents in development aid. So what are the options? As we've seen, generous giving to hardworking NGOs is important. But when it comes to fighting poverty and fostering development, smart U.S. government aid programs and fair trade policies have a far greater impact than all philanthropic efforts combined. How our government responds to these challenges does make a difference. And when we act together as a nation, there's certainly reason to hope. Considering all the wealth in our world, 700 million people living in extreme poverty is just not right. We can end hunger in our lifetime. We can do it because we care, or we can do it because it'll make our world more stable and our country safer. Or we can do it for both reasons. Thanks for joining us. I'm Rick Steves, wishing you thoughtful travels. Eugene, this has been a, a, a beautiful opportunity to get together. You know, your work is so important and your passion is an inspiration. Thank you for what you do and thank you for sharing with that with us tonight. Uh, Rick, I wanted to say the exact same thing. Uh, I'm uh, walking away really inspired, personally energized uh, to continue to do this important work. And I wanna remind people about how grateful we are at Bread for the World uh, to know that we've got so many people who are interested in learning more about our work. And maybe the last thing that I'll just say here is uh, maybe a line to help people think about why Bread for the World matters. Um, we believe that politics matter because they shape policies and policies impact people. This is why we do this important work of advocacy to help shape policies so that every single human being have an opportunity to flourish. Thanks so much again for having me. Thank you, Eugene. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, we wish you happy travels and thoughtful travels. We'll see you soon on Monday Night Travel. Good night, Eugene. Good night, everyone. Good night, Rick. Good night, Eugene. Good night, everybody.